Hey everyone, welcome to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. This is show number 184 of the IoT podcast, and we have an awesome show for you today. We're going to be talking about new Wi-Fi branding. What does it mean? We're talking about a new satellite network for IoT, and yes, Amazon is involved. Plus, California passed a reasonable security law for IoT devices that we talked about a while back, but now it's real. We'll talk about it a little bit more. We're going to add IBM Watson to your smart home if you want. And Apple is bringing keyless door entry to campuses. Plus, Kevin has some crazy ideas for door window sensors. Microsoft is bringing Cortana to noise-canceling headphones. Johnson Controls has bought a company. And Splunk introduced a new industrial IoT product. Speaking of industrial IoT, we're going to talk a little bit about GE's current troubles. And this week, we're going to hear from our sponsor, Cognizant. And our guest is Matthew Prince, who is CEO of Cloudflare. He's going to talk about how to re-architect the internet for IoT and basically computing at the edge. You're going to want to hear it. It's super awesome. All right. Now, let's hear a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Auklet. Your customers are not a distributed error tracking system. With 64% of IoT users encountering performance issues, you need Auklet, the edge-first problem-finding software. Auklet uses advanced function analysis and deep learning techniques to identify errors and performance bottlenecks across your entire deployment. Auklet brings you the traces, system metrics, and environmental conditions you need to fix issues before your customers find them. Get started for free at auklet.io. That's A-U-K. L-E-T dot I-O. Okay, Kevin, let's start off this week with branding. The Wi-Fi Alliance is at it again. They have decided that the 802.11.A-C-A-X-N-G-B-I don't know, Q, is all Mm -hmm. way too confusing. And their solution is to add numbers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So the new AX standard is going to be called Wi-Fi 6. I guess AC would then be 5. And I guess it would be N that would be 4. That's what they're doing. They're rebranding all those with numbers. You will not hear about Wi-Fi 1, 2, and 3 because we're you know all over that already. That's done and gone. We're beyond that. We're beyond that. Although a lot of smart home devices, doorbells in particular, tend to use like B or G they do. Yeah, so that's and, going to be interesting. And that gets us to a public service announcement about Wi-Fi. You probably do not need to update your system to AX. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, right. Don't do not do it. Don't do it. I'm an early adopter of these things, and I am not doing it. And you're going to, I'm sure, tell people why. Yes, because for this to be really awesome and to get the amazing GBs, the two point is it two point three gigabits per second capacity? I think it's one point two using all eight streams, and you have to be using one hundred sixty megahertz channels. That's the ah. biggest pipe, I believe, for AX. Okay, so to get one point two gigabits per second, you will also so you need to do that, and then your client devices also have to have the proper capability. Otherwise, they're just going to use what they can do. And back at N, I don't remember what that is, but it's certainly not a gigabit per second. I think it's 300 megabits per second. So don't rush to upgrade. Your smartphone's not using this yet, which is probably your most popular, most commonly used device. Certainly not your IoT devices. So if you think this is going to help you in that capacity, no. Right. You're going to first see routers that have this, and I believe there have been already two released. I don't recall who has put them out there, but don't rush to get them because you're right. Once you have the router, then you're going to have to wait for your client devices to have their hardware upgraded to take full advantage of this. And that means, yes, your phones, your tablets, your set-top boxes, your IoT devices, which again, probably won't get this capability anyway because you're going to have to cram more antennas in all of your devices to get this. So there's just no rush. Right. So wait for that 8K or 32K TV with all the antennas and maybe then. Maybe then, you guys. So one other thing, and this is kind of annoys me, and maybe I'm nitpicking here. Here's what I do not want to see happen, but I'm sure it's going to anyway. Do you remember, Stacey, when newer Wi-Fi came out and all of these companies said, hey, we've got 
5G Wi-Fi, oh, which Broadcom, technically, I am looking at you. Yeah, I am Broadcom. looking at you, Broadcom. Technically, that was correct because hey, this is this is the sixth generation of Wi-Fi standards for mainstream use. But don't please do not call it 6G. Don't even call the old one 5G because you're messing around with you know cellular network naming conventions. Then just don't do it. Mm -hmm. All right, I will call out the first one who does it. This is so upsetting to me that we're moving right along. I just can't handle it. So let's talk about oop, oop, satellite networks. Iridium is launching an IoT satellite network with Amazon Web Services. And this is designed to basically give you connectivity for things where there is no cellular connection. And I think this is so cool. <laughs> It is cool, and I totally understand what they're trying to do because, you know, there are remote areas where you might want IoT devices or applications, and you just don't have good cellular coverage. So it doesn't matter if, you know, you've got an NB IoT device and there's if there's no network there, it ain't going to do anything. It's funny to me, Iridium is like the satellite service that just will never die. Do you remember it was actually for voice communications way back in the day? Oh, yeah. For the, for the same reason, because of cellular coverage. Yeah. When you were going to your trip to Antarctica or your research into the deepest, darkest jungle, you had this like crazy sat phone. Or if you're a reporter going to the desert, you know, for a war zone, you had your sat phone. Yeah. Satellite is one of those expensive necessities. And it's they've always wanted to find use cases that, you know, drove more economies of scale, basically, because when you're doing satellite, one of the big costs is, well, one of the big costs is launching a satellite up in the air. But the other costs are you've got these really, the modules that you have to have to communicate with the satellite are very expensive because nobody buys this stuff because it's, again, expensive. To be honest, IoT actually makes more sense than some of the other implementations for satellite communications. For voice, well... for internet, you had like up to two second latency. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so high latency. So here's my question. They're talking about, and this is called Cloud Connect. They're talking about using it to like track planes in the air and that sort of thing, which makes sense. Another popular thing might be like, oh, let's stick it on a shipping container. But, and here comes the but, most of those are going to function with like normal radios that talk to a gateway. The gateway may need satellite backhaul, but a lot of that could actually just be done effectively via logging. So you could say, hey, if it's a refrigerated shipping container, you'll log it, like log temperature changes. And if it goes out of range, even if you get a notification, it's unclear if there's much you can do, like in the middle of the ocean, right? There may True. be something you could do. And it has to be a high value item to justify the costs of cellular. So I'm, I'm just thinking here that, and it's possible when you go back into cellular range, all the data that's been logged in that gateway will just upload and you're like, oh, everything's cool here again. I think it makes sense for some high value objects. Like if you're transporting diamonds, then heck yeah, pop it on this network so you can see it wherever it is. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe third I, time's a charm for Iridium. I don't know. Maybe. I'm just such a satellite. I, you know, I love satellites. I just am like, ah, it's such a difficult business model. All right. California. Ah, they're just going left and right. Crazy. Or maybe it's left and left. They supported net neutrality. They now have this new law that we talked about. It is the it's a cybersecurity law covering smart devices. It is the first state to pass such a law. It is SB 327. It passed in late August and the governor has signed it. It's a first step. It's minimal. So it needs work because it's just requiring that any device that connects to the internet has to have reasonable security features. And we talked about this on a prior show. It's a first step. It's not the end all be all by any means. Yes. So the law requires manufacturers to equip connected devices with, quote, a reasonable security feature or features designed to prevent hackers from accessing them. It does not define what those features should be. Some people are upset about this, but I actually think it's probably a good thing to keep this vague because technology and encryption technologies change so quickly. It does mandate that connected devices come with unique passwords that users can change. So, yay, I would love for them to say that, you know, you force users to change, but that didn't happen. I think they are forced or required to force the user to change if it doesn't come with a unique password. I think it's an either or. Ah, okay. So some critics have talked about the language being too vague, which I've just praised, but they're like, eh, it's not useful. And they also basically are like saying, hey, instead of forcing people to add security features, why don't you remove insecure features? I wish that they spent more time defining what those insecure features actually are. I mean, 
If I'm in one community, it is an insecure feature to connect your device to the internet. Typically, I think of good practices or for security or to make sure every device is over the air updatable. And again, force users to change their passwords. Unique keys actually are really relevant. And I like two-way encryption. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good thing. That gets a little far and deep, but you know, hey. Okay, so that is the new law. The idea is this only works for people selling devices in California, but as California goes, so do many other places since it is the most populous state in the U.S. So we'll see. Kevin has got IBM Watson. Are you going to add IBM Watson to your smart home? I think I might. We're not sure yet what it's going to bring to the table, but I think I might. IBM has actually put out a blog post that explains how to add IBM Watson services to Home Assistant, which I know is a platform some of our folks use. Home Assistant is open source, and it's something you kind of have to put on your own device, like a Raspberry Pi. Instead of buying a smart hub, Home Assistant becomes the hub. So it's more for the DIY folks and the folks who like to program. But I think it's going to be interesting to try, and I think I'm going to do this because I want to see, again, what Watson brings. The idea here is it's platform agnostic, it works with all the different devices in your house, and it will provide a unified interface. And then my guess is, based on what IBM is saying, it will help you and developers make or compose analytics, visualization dashboards, and new apps. I'm thinking... Will it bring some kind of machine learning? Will Watson actually start bringing more smarts to the smart home as a result of this? So that's the hope, but I will have to try it and see. For folks who have Home Assistant, it doesn't look too difficult to integrate. You might need a little bit of Python programming skills, but I think that's something everybody should have anyway. I'll get off my soapbox. And um, yeah, it's pretty much right out there in a GitHub, so you can go to the repository and add. Got it. And so are you looking for like visualizations of what's happening in your home? Like what kind of machine learning are you trying to do with your home? Well, you know, it would be nice if Watson saw that I'm doing the same things all the time manually. If there's a way to automate it, maybe it could kind of be like the Amazon Madam A hunches. Got it. And I still haven't... Have you got hunches on your Madam A yet? I got no hunches. No hunches. All right. Yeah, I I don't have hunches yet, but I am very curious to see how those turn out. If anyone else on the show has hunches, hey... Let us know what you think. Okay, moving right along. Let's talk about, ooh, locks. Apple's bringing keyless door entry to campuses. And, you know, you use your student ID to unlock your door. It uses uh, NFC. And Kevin, you were like, why aren't there more NFC locks out there? Yeah, I mean, this is great. I mean, you know, I'm taking classes at my community college. My daughter is taking classes at her college. And neither one is one of the three that Apple just added support to. And I think they'd already mentioned that this was going to happen at these campuses. It's Duke, University of Alabama, and University of Oklahoma. So student ID cards can be added to the Apple wallet and they can use that to, you know, when they need to show the ID, they can pay for things using their student account with that. But really interesting to me was using that to get into their dorms, the gym, or the library. And it's all done through NFC. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And the iPhone has NFC and so does the Apple Watch. So real handy. You don't have to carry a key or remember a key code. That's awesome. Why don't we have more NFC locks? Because to me, this just makes more sense than remembering little codes like we have at my house, for example. We punch in our key code and we get in, or it makes more sense perhaps than Bluetooth, which has a much larger range and might be easier to hack. You know, NFC, just put something close and boom, the door opens. I do recall that Yale had about two years ago some NFC locks, but I don't see them for sale anymore. And I just wonder if the idea of NFC locks was ahead of its time because people didn't have phones and watches with NFC at that time, but now it's becoming so prevalent, I think we need a resurgence of these. Kevin, I don't know. I want to think it's a power consumption thing, or maybe it was just people don't use it. And, you know, you do have to pop an extra antenna into something, and there's always interference and costs associated with that. But truly, I don't know. If any really smart RF engineer, or maybe there's like, maybe it's not an RF for (laughs) kind of issue. Maybe someone has a really good explanation. Feel free to let us know. So, all right. We're puzzled by this, but I am puzzled by this. Microsoft has brought Cortana to noise-canceling headphones. These are $350, which is expensive, but in the range for headphones. But why? I'm like, what? Why Why Cortana on a headphone? What? What is that for? Well, I mean, they debuted this earlier this week at their big hardware event, where they also debuted all new Surface products, you know, new Surface Pros, new Surface Hub, so on and so forth. So this kind of goes along with that in terms of new hardware. 
So who are they going to add? They're not going to add Google or Madam A. You know, they're going to try and get people using Cortana. They could get, I, they've got that partnership with Madam A. They do. And maybe they'll integrate Madam A into these with a firmware update later. But I'm not surprised they chose Cortana. The thing is, to use them or to use the Cortana bits, you do have to be paired with a computer or a phone or something that has Cortana already installed, obviously. And that's no different than Google Assistant or Madam A. But if you're not using Cortana on any other device, you're not likely going to buy these headphones. The one nice thing is, normally on headphones that have an assistant built in, you have to tap something to enable the assistant. You don't have to do that with these. These, it's kind of an always on thing. You can't set turn it off by default yet, but I presume you will be able to in the future. But you just say, hey, Cortana. And if you're wearing those headphones, she responds in your ears. Woo! Yay. So I am not buying these. All right. Moving right along to some quick news bits. Johnson Controls, which they make thermostats. They make control products for industrial stuff. They bought a thermostat maker called Lux Products. Lux, actually, a long time ago, was an advertiser on the show. I have their Kono thermostat, which is a $150 Wi-Fi-enabled thermostat that talks to Google Home and Madam A. Is that the nice-looking one? It is. It's the nice-looking one. It has, like, paintable fronts and that sort of thing, and it works. I don't know what else to say to you guys. It, it works. It's $150. People like it. So Johnson Controls now owns that. So yay! Splunk, which is, oh man, this is a data logging company. They now have their first industrial IIoT product, surprisingly called Splunk for Industrial IoT. And <laughs> this brings Splunk's logging software, its machine learning toolkit, and a data visualization package all to the industrial world. So this is really to capture and analyze data in a customizable dashboard, I suspect, then. It's more analytics than anything else. Yes. It's logging and analytics. So you get all this information, and then you can do stuff with it. Splunk has been involved in the IT world for a long time, logging all kinds of data. Now it is going into the what we call the OT world, which is operational technology. So that's things like sensor controls, industrial controls, really hardcore stuff. And a lot of that stuff is on its own network that never deals and touches with the IT network. So Splunk is basically saying, hey, we built something just for you. And this is in oil and gas, power, energy, transportation. All of these companies have these networks already established. So it's a big deal for Splunk. There are tons of tools in the industrial world that already kind of do this. So the competition there should be kind of interesting. But it's possible as these companies are pursuing the internet of things and what they call digital transformation, the IT guys are getting a lot more say in what happens on the OT side. So that may be Splunk's way in. Who knows? Okay. Speaking of industrial, GE, which kind of started it all like five years ago with the industrial internet of things. I was there when GE just started talking about its jet airplane engines and the terabytes of data and how it was going to do predictive machine learning or predictive maintenance on things and everything was going to be a service. Well, G has been in trouble for a while. And earlier this week, its CEO, John Flannery, who was a fairly new CEO, was surprisingly kicked out and replaced by Larry Culp. So now Larry, who GE was already in the midst of a reorganization and selling various assets. So now Larry Culp, the new CEO, is going to be finishing that up and trying to help GE get back on track. They also announced the sale of its intelligent platforms automation business to Emerson. And this week, I'm actually at the Emerson annual conference. And they announced this on Tuesday that they, Emerson announced this on Tuesday that they bought the intelligent platforms business. Sadly, they could not say much about it, including the deal terms. That business did generate about $210 million in revenue in 2017. So, you know, probably, hopefully higher than that. Yeah. And the interesting thing, it's almost like this was one of the more successful areas in this space for GE because, perfect example, early adopters of their industrial internet control system, according to Bloomberg, saw a 40% reduction in maintenance needs because of the predictiveness of the analytics. Right. And Emerson, which has their automation controls business, which is very much part of process manufacturing. So think anything like oil and gas, chemical refinery, even some food production. Those guys brought out a bunch of clients this week that talked about saving 
gobs of money is not a technical term, but actually generating real savings from their installation of smarter sensors and predictive and using things like predictive maintenance. So this dovetails really well, but it is still kind of like, we're all like, what is happening with GE? And the answer is a lot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's falling apart at the seams, but looks like some good companies are picking up the pieces and maybe we'll just see an export of, we'll call it digital know-how to a lot of other places. Emerson already had plenty of digital know-how, but you know, other places may not. You can never have too much know-how. Uh, I feel that some <laughs> people might feel that they have too much know-how. They don't need to tell me how much know-how they have. All right. Speaking of know-how, Kevin, you know how we can use our open door and sensors. window sensors. Yes, yes. I kind of feel like the door window sensor doesn't get respect. It's like the least respected thing in the IoT world in the smart home. So. And I had a couple sitting around, so I've I've been thinking about different ways to use them. Because what do most people use them for? Hmm, Doors and windows. Sure, for security. That makes total sense. But these things are pretty inexpensive. The batteries last a long time. And they just make for a great trigger event for so many different things that you can automate in the home. So this week I wrote a blog post explaining four unique use cases that I've come up with, and I'm sure other people have come up with more, so I'm hoping people share their own. I know you have a favorite. You can chime in when I say your favorite, but one example is, you know, my kids just don't turn on the exhaust fan in the bathroom when they take a shower, which is not good for the bathroom. It's terrible, actually. So I thought about spending some serious money for a exhaust fan that had a humidity sensor, but the easier thing to do is to just put the fan on a smart switch and then use a door window sensor on the actual shower door. So when they're taking a shower, it just goes on. That's it. Maybe it's not the most sightly thing to see having that sensor on a shower door. And if you have a shower curtain, obviously this is not going to work, but it works pretty well in certain cases. And I don't have to worry about that fan anymore. So that's one way. How does um, it handle the humidity? You know, I haven't seen any problems. Okay. You know, they're not like IP rated that I know of, but you know. To be honest, there should be less humidity when they're taking a shower than because the fan's on anyway, but I don't know. But they're cheap enough. It's 20, 25 bucks for a sensor. Oh, yeah. You know? Also, I tend to, after dinner, head to my little comfy chair, which is a recliner. And I thought about this. I'm like, why do I every night tell my home assistant to turn on the light next to the chair and turn on a playlist on the Google Home? I just put a door window sensor into the chair. I made the chair smart and nobody knows because you can't see it. To do it, I had to flip my recliner over and where the footrest resides when the chair is not in a reclining position, that's where you put the little magnetic contact. And then on the inside of the chair, you put the sensor itself. And then when you recline in the chair, you've got a trigger event. And now I sit down, my light goes on and my music starts playing. Really, really cool. Okay. That was my favorite one. Was it? Yeah. 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 It, and it's not going to, again, won't work on every recliner. You're going to have to have a you know, certain amount of space there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So one I've talked about before, but I'll mention it again because we use it all the time is, hey, why walk into a dark closet? Sure, you have a light switch for maybe a walk-in closet that puts a light on, but we were leaving the light on all the time. We'd walk out of the closet and not hit the switch. So we were wasting electricity, you know? So just put a door sensor on the back side of that closet door and put a smart bulb in this closet rather and just open the door. The light goes on. Close the door when you leave, the light goes off. So you're not walking into a dark closet and it's saving you electricity if you are like us and forget to turn that switch off. So So I do that on my, I do that in a couple of places. I do that on my closet door, but I do it with Mm -hmm. a motion sensor. And then I also do it in my laundry room because it is awesome when your hands are full of laundry just to walk in and it's like, whoop, whoop. And then again, I use a motion sensor there because if your hands are full of laundry, you're not going to be opening doors. The yeah, other place I use it mm-hmm. is a, a little toilet room that's part off the master bathroom. For nighttime, I have it set to go on at a dimmer lighting thing. So it's not like, I'm going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Ah! Mm-hmm. Okay. Makes sense. And we often have our hands full bringing laundry into the closet. So yeah, it makes total sense in a closet. All yeah. right. And for his other tips, you're going to have to read the article. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Teaser. Teaser. All right. I was going to say, speaking of teasers, it rhymes with freezers, but that's a terrible segue, so I won't do that, except I kind of did. We have the IoT Podcast Hotline coming to you with a question about both freezers and kegerators. Yay. And we're going to announce our winner for our September Windy Connected Schlage Lock Contest. And that winner is Derek, and he 
surprisingly, this almost never happens, is he's also our call-in person for today. So the IoT Podcast Hotline is brought to you by Schlage. With a variety of stylish and secure electronic locks to choose from, smarter homes start with Schlage. Learn more at schlage.com slash IoT. Okay, let's hear from Derek. Hi, Stacey and Kevin. This is Derek from Illinois. I'm calling in regards to a question on a freezer that I've modified to hold a keg of beer. that I'm trying to monitor how frequently it cycles. And I have a Z-Wave monitor, but it currently only reports out about every 30 minutes what the power usage is, so I don't get a very good idea of when it's actually running or not. So I was curious if you guys had any recommendations of a different product I could use that would allow me to track the power usage of a refrigerator, basically. Along with that, if you had a way to monitor the internal temperature of the refrigerator, that would also be helpful. I've had trouble finding any that don't require mounting the sensor inside, and it would have trouble getting out of the freezer. Any help would be appreciated. Thanks. All right, Derek, this is a lovely question and an easy one for the most part. So my suggestion to you right away is use a smart plug like the Wemo Insight or any smart plug that has some sort of energy tracking on it. And plug that in and you'll get a nice little graph of Azure refrigerator cycles, you'll see it happening. So that's that's one way to do it. And as for the temperature inside, we actually addressed that last week with a variety of temperature sensors. If you're worried about the wireless signal getting out of the refrigerator, which is like a giant Faraday cage, you can put it on a temperature probe, which is like the probe connects to a device and the probe sits inside the freezer and the device is actually outside the freezer. So that's one way to do it. Most of them we found were expensive or required a required a hub. So you may not love it, but someone else did suggest a cheaper alternative if you have smart things and are feeling incredibly technically savvy. So Todd Blount, one of our listeners, actually sent me an email and was like, hey, if you guys have smart things, he's been using the Xiaomi temperature sensors. They're around $9 to check his freezer temperature. So that's an option. You do have to download a special device handler on GitHub for the sensor and load that into smart things. So this is not, I mean, I think I fully believe that everyone is capable of doing this, but some people may not want to do this, but for nine bucks, it's a pretty good option. So yeah, it's actually pretty easy to install a smart things handler. I had to do it for some Fabaro devices, for example, and literally you're just downloading the code from GitHub, saving it as a text file or whatever the file format is for smart things, and then just using your smart things app to install it. Once you do that, then smart things, the hub knows what to do with information from that sensor or device. It's not so bad. And you mentioned, Stacy, the Wemo Insight switch. That was actually one of the first IoT devices that I added to my house. It's super useful. I wish we could do more than just look in the app and see a log or real-time energy use, but and there may be ways to do it. I have not looked at Wemo's APIs, but there's no simple native way to like use that as trigger events to say, hey, the refrigerator's been running too long, or something, maybe something's wrong as a result, or it's not running at all when it should be, right? There's just I have not found an easy way to use that. But still it is informative and I think we'll get Derek on the right track. Yes. It doesn't Fabaro. They also have an energy tracking outlet. It's a Z-Wave energy tracking outlet. If you have a hub. They do have some. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Derek, we hope that helps you and congratulations for winning. We're going to have a new contest for October and next week we'll tell you what you might win. In the meantime, feel free to give us a call at 512-623-7424 to ask us your questions and you will be entered to win in the October drawing even even now. And it's not a bag of snakes, so it is something you'd want to win. <laughs> no snakes, not even connected snakes. All right, that's it for this segment of the show. Please stay tuned for our guest, Matthew Prince, who is CEO of Cloudflare. And he's going to be talking about all kinds of new protocols and ways to make the internet cheaper and more distributed. So you're going to want to stay tuned. Hey everyone, we are taking a break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Cognizant. And I have with me today Frank Anthony Sami, Global Markets Leader for IoT at Cognizant. Frank, tell me about Cognizant. 
Stacy. Thanks for having me on. Cognizant is a global leader in business and IT services. And if you look at in large industrial companies today, with all the digital transformation and IoT that's going on, they are overwhelmed with the decisions that are in front of them, right from which sensors do I have, which IoT platforms should I use, what kind of business case. And really, we see our opportunity to help our customers through that complexity and make it simpler for them. So as you help companies, what do you typically focus on? What is your specialty? With the world becoming more connected, Cognizant sees a tremendous opportunity to helping every industry transform business models and lead with digital. These transformations, especially for companies in the industrial space, help them be more efficient or totally transform their business models, or both. I mean, technologies as we have at our disposal today, especially IoT, accelerate these transformations. And the way we look at IoT is just that. It is an accelerator to achieve business transformation. I mean, doing IoT is not the objective. Business transformation is. And we help our customers achieve that using IoT and other technologies. And our specialty, I think, is demystifying or simplifying this whole process. So through our advisory services, we help envision how their business priorities can make a big impact with a solution that connects their physical world, whether that be a factory or a retail store or a product, to the digital world, software, platforms, and analytics. Then we help them design and build that vision end to end. Your services and the focus on digital, it's all connected, right? Exactly. Connected is the key word. But how those connections work and what they connect is absolutely critical. I mean, for the longest time, large industrial enterprises have really had two different worlds. The world of their physical assets, the factories, the equipment, buildings, and even people. And then there was the digital world, the world of the CIO, software, workflows, algorithms, reports. And suddenly, through all the evolution in sensor technology and network capability and security advances and IoT platforms, these two worlds are coming and connected like never before. And the opportunity to leverage this connectivity to drive actionable insight and superior experiences is super exciting, which is why enterprises lean on us for our industry and technology expertise to bring together teams that are skilled in anthropology, user experience, hardware and software engineering, and really have the technical capability to stand up a complete solution that is enabled by the IoT stack. So is this real or theoretical? It's absolutely real. It is prime time now. I mean, for manufacturers, for consumer products companies and high-tech companies, it's complex when you begin connecting people, processes, and technologies in new ways, but it's exciting. And we're proud to be working with the largest industrial companies in the world to digitally transform them with IoT. Frank, this sounds great. Where can we go to find out more? You can go to our website, cognizant.com slash IoT, and you'll find all the details about what we do. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham. And today's guest is Matthew Prince, who is co-founder and CEO of Cloudflare. Hi, Matthew. How are you doing today? Stacey, I'm well. How are you? I am super great. So we are going to be talking about fun topic, how to remake the internet for, I'll call it the Internet of Things, but really, I think of this kind of as the next generation of the internet? I don't know. So Matthew, first for people, let's talk about why I'm asking you. You are with Cloudflare. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So Cloudflare, our mission is to help build a better internet. And to do that, we run one of the world's largest networks. So we have, as of this morning, I think, equipment running in 154 cities scattered all around the world. And what we're always trying to do is figure out ways to make the internet either faster or more secure more resilient, more efficient. And so what we're thinking about is how do you help ensure that you can democratize technologies, you can spread them out very broadly and make them available to anyone, anyone who needs them. And part of that, part of what we've been thinking about recently is, you know, a lot of when the internet first came out, it was a massive decentralizing force as you've had rises of companies like Google and Facebook that decentralized a lot of the internet and a lot of the innovation has come out of those companies. And so one of the things we really are always wondering and thinking about how we can play a role in is how can we then further decentralize that? And I think IoT is definitely one major aspect of, of that decentralization. 
I would probably agree with you. Before we get into like crazy nitty gritty technical details, because I think you guys are actually launching some products that make sense for this future internet. Let's break down what does the internet of the future need? We've talked about decentralization, but let's talk about how we think about designing this or how we think about the problem set before we start talking about, gosh, how do we fix it? The challenges of what the future internet are, how do you ensure that the best things about the internet continue to be true, which is that anyone, anywhere with an idea or a business or a piece of information can put that online and reach a global audience without having to go through, again, Google or Facebook to be able to do that. And Google and Facebook, you know, again, are amazing companies and they've created an enormous amount of value and they have a huge amount of technology, which means that, you know, information on their network works is faster. They have security built in from the beginning. They have just enormous resources. So as I think about the internet of the future, it's how do you take those advantages that the internet giants have and make them available to everyone? How can you make sure that even if you don't have an enormous amount of resources, you can reach everyone? I think that's on one side. And then on the other side, it's all about how do you make sure that the you know, 4 billion people on earth that still don't have internet access are able to get online and be able to have a great experience and be able to do so in a way that they can afford. And the challenge is that since so much of the internet is really centralized in North America and Western Europe, I mean, someone has to pay for the bytes to haul that traffic back. And that means that as you get further away from those places, the internet somewhat perversely becomes actually much more expensive for those people who actually can't afford to pay more for it. So if we were thinking about reinventing the internet, I would be thinking about how do you make sure that you democratize content creation on one side and then democratize access on the other. Wow. All right. That's a lot to think about. Let's talk about old ways of doing this. So we have had, and actually this is something I've seen on both the access and the kind of internet architecture side, which is peer-to-peer networks. So we've had in mm-hmm. historically things like Napster and original Skype, but then there were also really interesting things about distributed communication with networks like Serval, where if one person had phone connectivity, other people who had this program loaded on their phone could talk to each other and backhaul using the original phone. So how should we think about bringing those types of technologies forward or should we just skip all that and there's a new way to do it? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, the nature of technology is that it moves in sort of a sine wave over time where you have a massive dispersion and then consolidation. And so peer to peer networks were definitely a trend that went forward, you know, networks like Skype. But then you saw even when Microsoft bought Skype that they actually re-centralized the way that Skype worked much more. That doesn't mean that, you know, centralized is always the right answer. It doesn't mean distributed is always the right answer. It means that you're going to bounce between those two things and constantly be trying to disrupt whatever the reality was before and, and hopefully striving towards, again, a more distributed, more efficient, and more secure future of, of the internet. You know, one technology at Cloudflare that we're extremely excited about is a protocol, which is called IPFS, which stands for Interplanetary File System, which is actually exactly what it, it means. It was you know designed around the idea of if you actually had the internet not just span the globe, the earth, but you actually had to have an internet that worked cross-planetary that stops working when you have to rely on the speed of light because a particle of light going from Earth to Mars is, takes six minutes. And so you can't rely on traditional systems and you can't rely on traditional IP-based networks where content is addressed on an address itself. And so what IPFS does is it says, let's address content on the hash of the content itself. And then you can distribute that content across as many nodes as you want. So I think that's an extension of some of the things that we were working on with peer-to-peer networks. And then I think the other piece, which you know I think is really interesting, is when you get to blockchain and other cryptocurrencies, that that could create some sort of incentive system where people could say, listen, I've got a little bit of extra space on my server. Or I've got a little bit of extra bandwidth. Here's a way that I can actually get compensated for that. Well, I think there's been a lot of hype, obviously, around some of the cryptocurrencies and blockchain. I think in this case, they're actually that if you combine the ability to address content on a hash of the content itself, and then you combine an incentive structure behind that, 
with that it has some cryptocurrency or other, you know, micropayments type system, that that might be a way, again, of democratizing core internet access. And so, you know, I'm really, I think what Protocol Labs is doing is really interesting. I think, you know, the sort of ideas around things like Filecoin are really interesting. And so, you know, Cloudflare, what we're trying to do is say, how can we connect together kind of the traditional internet with now this massively distributed internet. And so about two weeks ago, we announced support for IPFS across our entire network so that you could, through a standard browser, be able to access the interplanetary file system. And and again, I don't know that we know exactly where that's going to go, but if we can be a gateway to make it so that more people can access these new technologies, I think that's one of the key things to making sure that they can be accessible and brought online. Okay, so we've talked about distributed. We've talked about making things cheaper. We've even talked a little bit about some of the things you guys have done. Let's talk about your birthday week announcements. So the last couple of weeks, you guys have been just dropping news left and right. It's been kind of fun. Some of it I don't care very much about, like becoming a registrar, but yay for y'all. But there are lots of things I do care about. The one I was most excited about was actually the Bandwidth Alliance. So talk to me just a little bit about what your goal is there. Yeah, so what the Bandwidth Alliance is, is it's a group of cloud providers that have come together to say that we should reduce the cost of moving data between different providers. So typically, if you're using a cloud provider like an AWS or a Google Cloud or a Microsoft or an IBM, when you put data into them, it doesn't cost you anything. But if you want to take data back out, it's kind of like the Hotel California. It costs you a lot to get that data back out. And in some cases, that makes some sense because if you're a cloud provider and you've got to haul data from you know, Ashburn, Virginia, where you've got your data center back to some user who's in Sydney, Australia, you've got to pay for that with a number of transit providers that sit in that chain. It's the markups on bandwidth are extremely high, but it does probably make sense for there to be some cost. On the other hand, sometimes a cloud provider, they will hand that data directly off to another cloud provider like Cloudflare. And in that case, we're actually connected over what's known as a private network interface or a PNI. And that's literally a piece of fiber optic cable, a couple hundred meters long, that goes from our router to the cloud provider's router. And while it costs something to put that in place in the beginning, and obviously there's a cost of the router and things like that, there's no incremental cost for sending bandwidth across that existing link. And so our question to the cloud providers was, if we're not paying for the data and you're not paying for the data, why should customers be paying for the data? And, you know, I think that the real leader here was Google. And Google, back in 2015, created something called the CDN Interconnect Program. And Cloudflare was one of the very first members of that. And that was really our inspiration for gathering all the other cloud providers, save one, who we're still working on, together to say, let's find a way that if you're exchanging data in a way that doesn't have any incremental cost to you, and doesn't have any incremental cost to us, that it shouldn't have any incremental cost to our customers. And I think the long-term value here is that if we can make it so that you can not have to say, I'm going to pick Amazon and use everything in Amazon stack, but instead say, well, you know, IBM is doing some really interesting stuff around AI, so I'll use them for AI. And then you know, Microsoft is doing some really interesting stuff with Microsoft 365, so I'll use them for that. And Google is doing some really interesting stuff with their, you know, fast storage and database systems, and it's more like Backblaze has really cheap data where they can store things. If we can make it so that we're the fabric that connects all of those different cloud providers together without you having to pay to move your data between them, I think that what that allows is cloud providers to actually specialize. And instead of everyone sort of just saying, oh, I've got to do yet another thing that Amazon is doing, people to say, I'm going to build the best of breed for this one particular thing, and people will choose me for that. And overall, our hope is that that actually makes the overall ecosystem significantly richer. Amazon so far is the one major holdout from this, and we're talking to them, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to convince them that this is the right customer-centric thing to do. Okay. And let's talk about another one of your announcements that is tied to something that you guys did, actually, I believe, last spring. Y'all launched a program called Workers, which I thought was really interesting. That's been out for a while, so I'd love to get an update on how people are using that. And then you guys also announced a key value store for workers, which sounds really exciting. Like data could be all over the place and accounted for, but tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, if you think I think there's being 
you know, to date, not counting workers, sort of three generations of how you've been able to deploy network server applications. And so, you know, generation one was you had an application, you bought a server, and then if you needed a new a new application, you bought a new server. And so the deployment time for that was measured in months. In 1999, the next generation occurred, which is VMware. And then, you know, other open source versions like Zen released virtualization engines. And that allowed you to take one server and turn it into many. And that took that deployment time from, you know, months down to days or weeks. You still had to coordinate with other people in order to launch something, but you could actually take your unused capacity on servers and you could say, we're going to run multiple applications on the same actual server infrastructure. And not only did that, but it increased the actual utilization of those resources. The next generation of that you know, really launches in 2006, which is Amazon Web Services and all the other cloud hosting providers. And what they said was, let's take your, instead of you having known that infrastructure, let's take those same VMs and use them as either VMs or later containers and deploy them across our infrastructure. And that took that deployment time down from you know days or weeks to minutes or hours in order to be able to do it. But there's still this model of you manage a AWS instance as if it was a virtual server. And you still had to make sure that this security was properly configured, that everything else was in place. What we were doing with workers is we hope creating what is that next generation. So we all know what bare metal is. We all know what VMs are. We all know what containers are. What we built workers around was a new idea, which is something called Isolate. And Isolate sounds really exotic, except for all of us use them every day in our browser. It's what V8 does to sandbox JavaScript between different sites from one another. And in your browser, you need for when you encounter JavaScript, for that to be able to just start executing incredibly quickly. So you need very, very, very fast, cold start time. And then you need a very efficient end in the process because you don't have a giant server-based CPU in your, in your laptop. So you need to be able to do that. At the same time, you need to have different pieces of code running next to each other, but having process isolation from one another and some real sandboxing that exists. And so what we did was we took that same technology that was inside the V8 engine and the isolate, and we deployed that as code running at the edge of our network. And what was amazing about that is that took deployment time down from what now is minutes or hours to seconds, and it took cold start time from what is seconds or minutes down to milliseconds. And so what's powerful is with workers, you can write code deploy it to our entire network of, again, over 154 cities today, running on every one of our machines out there. And then you can literally deploy it as if it is an individual function to perform whatever whatever functionality you need. And it will be available as much as you need, whenever you need it, with almost instantaneous cold start times. And so that's a different model for deployment. The one thing that's been missing from that is that you didn't have a way to actually save state. But we knew that the big piece that was missing was actually the ability to save state and have some persistence. So during our birthday week announcement, we announced that we're releasing a key value store that runs the Cloudflare's whole edge. And what that means is you can write a piece of data to any one of our facilities out at the edge that writing is is instantaneous. And then our system will figure out the consistency model for that across the rest of the network and then save that state. And then if you've written it in, say, Vienna, and then read it in San Jose, and it can be instantly available, and then that information will be actually cast out at our edge unless it's updated, and then those caches are purged out. And so what that gives you is the ability to write applications that run out at the edge of the network and then actually make those applications much more sophisticated by being able to have some sort of a data store that's associated with it. I think what you'll see us do over time is expand in both directions. So earlier this week, we actually announced that instead of just supporting JavaScript, workers now support anything that can compile the WebAssembly. That includes languages like C, C++, Rust, Go, And if you've ever wanted a massive global network with beefy servers where you can run your C code within a couple milliseconds of 95% of the world's population, we've now made that possible. And that's an exciting new set of applications that can come from it. And then the other dimension that will expand across is, you know, key value store is sort of the most base data store that you can have. 
but you'll see us launch object stores and then much more complete databases that run across our entire network. And you know, I think that if you can combine those things with a low latency, high performance compute combined with a very sophisticated data store, the types of applications that you can build are really substantial. And so, you know, what we've talked about before is the real value of workers is how do you take like an IoT device where you're trying to drive down the build of materials and make it as inexpensive as possible, but and then make it actually smarter over time. So there are a lot of IoT manufacturers that we're talking to now, and actually many that have started to deploy the ability to take their legacy devices that are in the field and then add things like image processing or voice recognition or additional intelligence. And they don't have to actually update, you know, they don't have to get a consumer to go out and buy a new device. They're instead saying, well, Cloudflare is going to be within a few milliseconds of every device that we've ever sold. And so what if we say the device is good at sort of a, the UI portion, but then the actual intelligence can live up in the network, but we can have the short latency and high efficiency you can get by being as close as we are to every internet user on Earth. Okay, final thing that we should talk about is you guys announced support for an IETF standard called QUIC, Q-U-I-C. So why don't I let you define that? <laughs> so QUIC really is a replacement for HTTP. And one of the differences of it is that instead of being a TCP-based protocol, it's a UDP-based protocol. And TCP-based protocols have a handshake where you have to send a, a SYN signal and the server responds with an ACK to set up the handshake. And then only after that can you exchange data Whereas UDP-based protocols are fire and forget protocols where you just fire data across the line and that if there's anything that's needed, then the server will respond back or the client will respond back saying, hey, I missed this, this particular thing. Quick is designed to be a, around a UDP-based protocol and then it's got error correction in it to be able to fix any problems that come across the line if there's any noise or anything else that might potentially have interfered with any of the communication. Where this really matters is TCP-based protocols are terrific for devices that are connected to a wire and don't move around a lot. But more and more of the things that connect to the internet are on wireless connections and they move around all the time. And the problem with TCP is that in those conditions where you see loss, TCP is actually incredibly low on the performance side. And so what Quick does is, first of all, it builds security in by default. And then secondly, it really designs around an increasingly mobile experience where we know that there's going to be loss on the line. And that doesn't necessarily mean a router is, is overwhelmed. That could mean because somebody turned on the microwave or you have to walk around the corner. And so Google was really the leader in building the original Quick protocol. It was a proprietary protocol that they used for a substantial amount of their own property. And then that protocol has been adopted by the IETF and turned into the IETF IETF's own version of that. And that protocol has finally gotten ratified by the IETF. And so what Cloudflare has done is we've said, we'll again be that gateway where if there's a mobile device, we'll be able to talk to it over quick. And then behind us, we'll still speak TCP and HTTP and all the things that standard web servers are able to support across the wired connection that we have. And so we hope to bring the best of both worlds, both the connection from the device that's wandering around the street back to the Cloudflare network out running at the edge of, of the internet, and then using much more traditional protocols to get from the edge of our network back to our customers without our customers having to do any work. So we think that this is, again, something that helps make the internet more mobile, helps make it more accessible, and again, democratizes something that previously was really reserved just to, just to Google. Okay. And now all of the things we've talked about, a lot of them are focused on things that run at the edge of your network. And you're at, your network is in, I believe you said, 154 cities. So because this is all tied back to you guys, how do you answer the charge or the idea that, well, are we just centralizing around Cloudflare in many different places? I think that that's actually a really fair criticism and something that we should ask, you know, in all these cases. So I think with each of these things, We've tried to be someone to help in terms of pushing the internet forward, but doesn't require us to be the only provider of that. So in the case of IPFS, we're providing a gateway between browsers that don't support IPFS and the IPFS 
rest of the world. But if you have a browser that supports that DFS, you can bypass Cloudflare entirely. And there's nothing that we've done that's locking that down. We're trying to expand the number of people that use the technology and not reduce it. In terms of bandwidth alliance, you know, while today we're the connected tissue that hooks these providers together, we're already getting the providers to talk with each other and saying, well, if, you know, Backblaze wants to connect directly to DigitalOcean, great. They can do it and not pass through Cloudflare. And our vision for the Bandwidth Alliance is to actually spin it out of Cloudflare and have it as an independent, standalone entity. And with something like IETF Quick, you know, it's not protocol. It's not something custom that we built. It's not something that's proprietary. It's us trying to solve what is a chicken and egg problem on the internet, which is the browser guys don't want to support something because the server guys don't support it. And the server guys don't want to support something because the browser guys don't want to support it. And what we found at Cloudflare that can be very positive for our role is we can be kind of the first mover in solving those problems. And we can say, listen, I don't care what side you're on, we're going to support the new standard, and that's going to give it enough critical mass to hopefully get adoption. So there are plenty of things that we do to really you know, support our own business, and you know, we're a for-profit company, and we want people to use our services, but we're always trying to give back more than we capture. And if that's you know, helping decentralize the internet, you know, I think that's a much better outcome for us than, again, if the only way that you can get online is through, through Google and Facebook in the future. Awesome. All right. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Stacey, thanks for having me. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyonioT.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you.